Good afternoon. It's wonderful to be here with you today. We are in the second week of Luke and Acts in 70 days. Um, last week we talked about chapter 1 and 2. This week we're going to um, hit the high points of 3 through 9. And um, I want to remind you that Luke had a very specific purpose in mind in writing this gospel. It was written to help strengthen the faith of all believers and to answer the attacks of the non-believers. Um, Luke was, it was important for, for Luke to point out that uh, there was a place in the kingdom of God for Gentile Christians and that his kingdom, God's kingdom, is based on the gospel. He wanted to make sure that the gospel was commended to the whole world. This is important to him because he himself is a Gentile. Our joys and concerns. Um, it is with sadness that I report that longtime member of uh, the Jubilee class, Ruby Pruitt, passed away in her sleep uh, Wednesday night, perhaps Tuesday night, Tuesday night, um, and very peacefully. And thankfully, um, one of the last persons she saw was Pastor Dan, and he prayed with her. And um, she responded to that when her daughter came after that she said that the pastor had been there and they had prayed together and so um, she found a great deal of peace in that. Um, pray for her family. Um, Ruby was 92 years old and she had been living with her daughter Margie for the last 30 years so it's going to be a big adjustment in their family. Um, continue to pray for Debbie Meyer in her uh, healing and rehabilitation. And um, we just continue to pray for all of us here in the church family. We've been hearing more and more cases of COVID cropping up and uh, just pray for our, everyone's protection and healing there. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we, we love you and we welcome the opportunity to come into your presence, to praise you, to express our thanks to you, to express our love and our praise. You are so awesome that it is beyond our words, but we are thankful that you can read our hearts. We love you, Lord, and that's only possible because of your great love poured out on us first. We thank you for this opportunity that we have. We pray, we thank you for your word and for the opportunity to look into it together hoping that you will open our eyes and open our minds and open our hearts to new insights and in ways that will start and continue our transformation, the transformation into more and more of your likeness. We seek to be like you. We seek to be near you. We seek to be part of your kingdom building efforts here on this earth. We lift up to you today those that we love that are struggling with health concerns, those that we love that are struggling with loss, those that we love who are just struggling with some element in their life. 
it is part of the human condition, Father, to experience times of suffering. And it is only because of your presence with us to give us guidance and comfort and strength and encouragement that we are able to bear up under those sufferings. And not only to survive them, but to come out on the other side looking more like you, loving you more, trusting you more. Be with us, Father. Heal those who are suffering. We boldly ask for, for restoration, for being made whole again. And even if that isn't to be within your will, while we're here on this earth, that we be made completely whole, we do know that we look forward to that time when we will be made whole in your presence and enjoy being with you for eternity. Father, we lift up also brothers and sisters around the world who are suffering in difficult circumstances. In fact, even horrifying circumstances. Strengthen them, Father. Grant them your courage. Grant them your wisdom. Grant them, grant them your love in their time of need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, last week, we looked at chapter 1 and 2 of Luke, which included the birth announcements of John the Baptist and Jesus and their birth stories, and went uh, on to continue not just their birth stories, but um, Mary and Joseph bringing Jesus to the temple to adhere to the Jewish law and for dedication and purification, and also um, the recognition from Anna and uh, Simeon there that this was the child that they'd been waiting for. And then the story of Jesus as a young boy um, in the temple in conversation with the, with the religious leaders of the day. So today, we are going to go into the, the big category of um, Jesus' ministry primarily in the Galilean area. And I have included in your email um, a map, and Galilee is at the northern um, <clears throat> portion of the, that area on the map. Uh, you see the Sea of Galilee there. And um, it is in that area that what we're going to be, the readings for today, are his ministry uh, primarily in that area. And we'll refer back to the map every once in a while. Uh, so the hymn for today, because it is about uh, the stories of the ministries of Jesus, that is the hymn we're going to sing, Tell Me the Stories of Jesus. And I do not have the recording of that, so we're just going to sing it a cappella. Um, <coughs> I promise you will n notice my deficits a lot less if you're singing along. Tell me the stories of Jesus I love to hear. Things I would ask him to tell me if he were here, scenes by the wayside, tales of the sea, stories of Jesus, tell them to me. First let me hear how the children stood round his knee, and I shall fancy his blessing resting 
raining on me. Words full of kindness, deeds full of grace, all in the love light of Jesus' face. And we'll continue with the opening. We commit ourselves individually and as a community to the way of Christ to take up the cross, to seek abundant life for all humanity, to struggle for peace with justice and freedom, to risk ourselves in faith, hope, and love, praying that God's kingdom may come. Um, when we look first at uh, chapter three, we are going to see in chapter three and part of four, um, the preparation of Jesus for his public ministry. We have talked about how John the Baptist came to prepare the way for the Lord. His job was to prepare the way of the Israelites individually and as a corporate body for the coming Messiah and the gospel message. Um, the truth is that throughout their history, just as in our history with God, um, it was the pattern of the Israelites to come close to God and fall away from God. Come close to God, fall away from God. And they had been, before the coming of John, they had been in a period of apostasy there had not been a prophet from the Lord um, in 200 years when John's um, ministry began. And um, they had practices within the Jewish faith of baptizing those who were not of Jewish heritage who converted to Judaism those were those folks went through a ritual baptism but there was not a general baptism for all uh, of the Jewish people and John's baptism was a little of a little different nature than the ritual baptism that they had for those who were converting John required uh, for his baptism by water uh, as a symbol of the baptism that they requi he required repentance. Now that word repentance, I'm sure that you've all heard, um, and I didn't have this fact in my head. I knew that re repent means to turn around. That actually is the Old Testament Hebrew meaning when repent is used it meant to them to turn around toward the Lord. And, um, <clears throat> and that still is an, part of the meaning of repent. But in Luke, Luke's use of it, which was written in Greek, um, it meant to change one's mind. And John insisted that those coming to him had to change the way they were thinking and the way they were living. He, those were the demands that he insisted upon for bab his baptism by water. His demands had a lot to do with social justice. Um, when he was talking to the tax collector and the Roman centurion, and um, they asked what they should do, uh, he, he made it, um, customized for each one of them. And one of his suggestions was they needed to be generous with the poor and they needed to be honest in their dealings. And um, so we will come back to that question later. Um, but here we are at Luke 3, verse 15 through 16 and including 18. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts 
if John might possibly be the Messiah. And John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And with many words, John exhorted the people. There was a lot of teaching with his time with the people and proclaimed the good news to them. Um, when that chapter opened, I, I failed to mention this, that when the chapter opened, Luke spent some time giving the names of uh, the rulers of the day and the religious leaders of the day. And those help pinpoint uh, date-wise the beginning of John's ministry and um, also sort of the general historical period during which the ministry of Christ unfolded. Um, Luke's record looks first at John's period of prominence where he's announcing the coming of the Lord and baptizing only those who have repented. So folks from all over the community were coming and Jesus went to John to be baptized too. Um, there are some questions about that. For the Jews of the day, and even for the Christians, uh, as, as they became known later, the followers of Jesus, this was sort of an embarrassing thing because they are recognizing him as the Messiah or being asked to recognize him as the Messiah. And here he's coming to John for a baptism of repentance when he is one who is without sin. Um, scholars pretty much agree that Jesus uh, went to John to be baptized too for two reasons. One, to lend authority and legitimacy to John's message to John's ministry. He, he was, in effect, being a witness by going and asking John to baptize him too. He was being a witness to the validity of John's message and prophecy. Um, and the other aspect of it is what's coming up in the next scripture, Luke 3, 21 through 23. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. By the way, you can look on your map, and uh, it is usually believed that uh, uh, most of these baptisms were occurring uh, just north of the Dead Sea on, in the Jordan River. So you can see there, there's a town marked Bethany beyond the Jordan that um, is one of the places that John's baptism ministry was occurring, and many um, have deduced that that's a likely spot for where Jesus was baptized. And as he was praying, and uh, while other Gospels mention the baptism of Jesus, none of them have him praying in it. But that's another major theme that runs throughout Luke of Jesus praying. Jesus was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven. You are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. So for Luke, Jesus' baptism rather than being a baptism of repentance, for which we know Jesus did not have sin to repent of, first it was <coughs> to valid give validity to John's ministry, but, but even more importantly for Luke, the baptism is about Jesus' divine sonship. And because there is an audible voice and a theophany of the Holy Spirit 
represented by a dove. Um, if you'll remember, a theophany is the presence of God within an anim within an object that we recognize, that we as humans can can recognize. Um, and so, this is another statement of Jesus's messiahship coming from God Himself. Um, if you notice there that it is the first picture we have of the Trinity. It is the Holy Spirit descending like a dove. It is the voice of God the Father from heaven. And it is Jesus the Son being recognized by His Father. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So we come up across, and we've talked a little bit, just a minute, uh, that one of Luke's themes has to do with Jesus um, seeking wisdom, courage, strength from his Father through prayer. Um, but there, there's another theme prevalent here in, it, in Luke, and it has to do with his mentioning the Holy Spirit. In chapters one and two, when we covered those, lots of Holy Spirit activity, the angel Gabriel came and talked. But uh, if you'll remember that um, Elizabeth was overtaken by the Holy Spirit. And there, there was evidence of the Holy Spirit brought up in those early accounts in chapter one and two. Now we have the Holy Spirit pre uh, present with the baptism of Jesus. And I want you to begin noticing what the role of the Holy Spirit was. Um, if we just look at this, John says that Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And, um, and fire. And so if you think about Pentecost, the event at Pentecost, the followers, the Holy Spirit was poured out upon them as a body and they were each touched with tongues of fire that were representative of the Holy Spirit. Um, in that sense, the Holy Spirit was meant to fulfill people, to inspire people, to challenge people, to comfort people, to give them courage, to cleanse people. A pouring out of the Holy Spirit there with baptism was to cleanse um, the human recipients. In the sense where the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus at His baptism, even Jesus received strengthening from the Holy Spirit and empowering. Um, and then, after his baptism, if you'll look on your map, you see the area north of the Dead Sea. Jesus was um, led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness, and that's just to the west. You can see a dark, ridge um, there of, it's a mountainous area, the mountains of Judea, um, but it is also known as a wilderness area. Um, and that is where Jesus left, the Holy Spirit took him right after his baptism into the wilderness, um, during which he was tempted by the devil just a second on that. Um, by the New Testament times, the devil, that the use of that, uh, the meaning of that, had devil had become the seducer and the tempter of humans. And the goal of the devil was to destroy people's relationship with God. That was his intent. 
the opposite side of that, God's intent in interacting with human beings is always to draw them closer to Him. And the devil's intent is to cause a breach in that relationship. So we find that Jesus is tempted because He has the Holy Spirit. Um, before He is uh, to start His ministry, it's going to be really important for Him to be strengthened in the divine use of His power. Sin comes not from being tempted, but it comes from choosing to use the power that is available to us in a way displeasing to God. And it's necessary for even Jesus to make a conscious decision about His obedience to God. Um, some have argued about um, whether there was actually a, represent, a physical representation of evil present with Jesus in uh, the wilderness, or whether that was a battle with evil that took place inside him. Because for us, as human beings, that's the real place where temptations take place, is inside of ourselves. Um, and we need to notice how Jesus responds to those struggles that he is experiencing. Um, the tricky part of this is that a real temptation is an offer not to fall, but to rise because it's a lie. But think back to the Garden of Eden. The tempter did not say, do you wish to be evil? Do you wish to be a devil? He said, do you wish to be like God? That's where the temptation was. The temptation wasn't to be bad. The temptation was to be good, but in a way that usurped God's uh, power in your life. Um, so let's look at this time in the wilderness, Luke 4, 1 through 13. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit. Now, we're going to see why that was important as we go along, what the role of the Holy Spirit is there. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. The purpose in that being so that Jesus could be prepared for his ministry. One of his preparations for ministry was being baptized by John and having God's power poured out and the recognition that he was the Son of God. Um, that was one of the ways that Jesus prepared for ministry. But he went, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. Um, and you know that in the, the he, uh, Israelites had to spend 40 years in the desert. That term 40 has, has distinct symbolism to them and the wilderness does too. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. One of the first things we need to hear in verse 3 is one of the, the ways that uh, evil opens its door into us is by making us question our relationship with God. He tries to get Jesus to question it, if you are the Son of God. 
and he tempts him with a personal request. Jesus is hungry. We've already, scriptures already acknowledge that. <coughs> um, but he's being tempted to use his divine power that has been poured out and imbued upon him by the Holy Spirit He's being tempted to use that um, to satisfy his own, own personal needs or well-being, putting that before the will of God or for putting that before the good of all. And it's as if his physical needs are set out to be the most important needs. Uh, he didn't succumb. We will see this as a repeating response. Every time Jesus is tempted, he uses scripture to, as a way of strengthening his resolve and dealing with the temptation. Um, something that was relatively uh, new in my process about this was that one of the things that's going on here in these temptations is that the Jews had certain expectations for who the Messiah was and what he was going to do in regards to them. And one of those beliefs was that when the Messiah came, he was going to usher in a time of unlimited prosperity, a time when they would be, no longer be hungry, that they would be full, a time when they would live in comfort, um, a time of fullness. And so this part of this temptation of, that Christ experienced may have been a temptation to fulfill the popular messianic hopes, to be what the people expected him to be instead of what God planned for him to be. But he managed to rebuke that temptation. So then, verse five tells us that the devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered another scriptural quote. It is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So the first temptation had to do with putting personal well-being above the will of God. <clears throat> this one, Jesus is being tempted to put political glory um, or to rule the world by military might rather than by the power of God. And again, this was a popular messianic expectation of the day. It was an expectation that Jesus was going to bump up against constantly in his ministry. When is the time, Jesus, that you're going to take over and put down the Roman rule and lift us up as a military power? So this was the temptation that Jesus had to make a conscious decision about that he was going to stay within the power of God and not within the expectation of the people. We also need to look at that term worship. Um, Satan or the devil says, if you worship me, and Jesus said it is written, worship the Lord your God. And so Worship includes giving oneself over totally to the power of the one you worship. And Jesus was unwilling to give the power over 
to the devil. He was intent on keeping the power behind him as the power of God. So the devil doesn't give up. The devil led him to Jerusalem. What do we know is in Jerusalem? The temple. And he had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, and now even Satan's going to quote some scripture. He will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. And just as a sideline, that opportune time was in the Garden of Gethsemane. That was the next opportune time. So in this third, the first was to put his personal well-being above the will of God. The second was to usurp power uh, from Satan instead of from God in his military might. And um, the third has to do with Jesus is trying, uh, the, the devil is trying to convince Jesus to seek hard evidence that he has God's power. Here we are with um, a young man in Nazareth who's been raised as the son of a builder and um, he may have been in fact needing some reassurance that he was indeed the son of God. Uh, he's being tempted not to live into faith on that issue but to require proof. That's what the devil wanted him to do was in order to believe you need to, you need proof so just come up here and jump off this building the temple because uh, in the Jewish faith they had been told the Messiah uh, would be seen at one point uh, uh, standing on the temple tower um, this is the temptation to live not by faith but by proof and either Jesus was being tempted on that on a personal level, or maybe he was being tempted to do something with his power that would prove to his followers that he was the Son of God, instead of, of uh, having them come to him through faith. Jesus chose for himself the route of trusting and being obedient to God and that is the, the route he chose also for his followers, that they would need to trust in, the, in God and be obedient to him. So, the rest of our readings, Luke 4, uh, chapter 4, I mean, Luke chapter 4, verses 14 through 9, verse 50, pertain to the beginning ministries of Jesus in Galilee. Um, Dan shared with us, Pastor Dan shared with us at our Bible study on Wednesday that the life and ministry of Jesus occurred within a land mass about the size of New Jersey. He never ventured further than that, except when they fled to Egypt when he was a baby and then returned to the land of Israel. His life and, and his ministry occurred in a very small land mass uh, that you can see there on the map. Uh, and as a setup for this next reading, it is for us to know that some of Jesus' fame early on came from teaching in the synagogue that he did on a regular basis, and he attended corporate worship 
at the synagogue. Um, the worship there at the synagogue was fairly informal. It consisted of prayers and scripture readings and comments on the readings and an offering for the poor. And any adult male was welcome to read scripture at the synagogue service each week. So that's where we find Jesus. This is his um, inaugural address, so to speak. Luke 4, 14 through 20. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And news about him spread through the whole countryside. Uh, there on your map, he had been down in Judea, uh, in the wilderness of Judea, and in the, the area where he was baptized. But he's come back to Galilee, and he's at the synagogue in Nazareth. He went to Nazareth. Oh, he was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, which was Isaiah 61, verse 1 and 2 and in our scripture. Um, and he began to read, the Spirit, <coughs> excuse me, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. He claims his own. He claims his own messiahship. He uses this to announce the purpose for his coming and to define what it means to be Messiah. And look at what that definition was, that it would be anointed, the Messiah would be anointed, one. He would proclaim good news to the poor, freedom for the prisoners, sight for the blind, uh, uh, freedom for the oppressions, those in oppression, and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That is what the Messiah is going to do. It wasn't what they expected the Messiah to do. But here is his first claim about what it's really going to look like. And he proceeds from that point on uh, to preach, to teach, and to heal throughout the area, demonstrating the reign of God is beginning here and now, and uh, arousing controversy with religious authorities because he challenged their current understandings. He chose 12 men to follow in his ways. Um, apostle, that is what they were entitled, they were called apostles, and that really means those who are sent out. Now, we have uh, only 12 apostles, but um, there were many disciples, and sometimes we confuse those words. There's some overlap because a disciple means a learner, someone who's in a position of learning from a wiser one. Uh, a more mature one. And these particular men, though, were chosen at, out of the disciples to become apostles that Jesus would send out. 
And in all of the work that he did, Jesus exhibited authority over earthly reality. Think about those stories that you read this past week and what, how Jesus' authority was claimed in those stories because he calmed a storm. He cast out demons. He had victory over death. He raised people from the dead. He healed the sick. He fed 5,000 people with a meager offering of loaves and fishes. And just as Luke's purpose in his, this thread of writing, the, the reason that we read in a, a uh, faster and, um, and, and bigger chunks of scripture in this study is to show us the thread that's going through the whole thing. It becomes more obvious. Everything Luke is doing in his writing, in his recording of these orderly events is to draw attention to the Messiahship of God. And so what happens is people start acting, asking. They see these events and they recognize that something beyond their understanding is going on. And they began to ask, who is this? The Pharisees ask it in chapter five. The disciples themselves ask it in chapter eight with the calming of the storm. Herod even asks it. And it comes to where Jesus in chapter nine asks the question in this way, who do the crowds say that I am? And he gets answers like Elijah and John the Baptist. The three answers he got all had to do with being a prophet. That's what the crowds were saying. He was a prophet. And then Jesus asked his apostles, who do you say that I am? And only Peter answers the Messiah or one, one translation is the Christ of God, which Christ means Messiah, the Messiah of God. Jesus is not just a prophet. He is the Messiah. Jesus' followers must lay aside everything that gets in the way of obedient discipleship um, to follow me, when he says that, means to copy his life in their own life. Peter, after this um, conversation in which Peter identifies Jesus as Messiah, Peter, James, and John go with Jesus up on a mountaintop to pray. Here again, we have Luke's emphasis on Jesus praying, in t especially when th there's some important decision or some important event coming up. So they go up on the mountain to pray, but something beyond expectation happens. As he's praying, his face begins to change and his clothes become bright like lightning. And Moses and Elijah appear in glorious splendor. There is a brightness to it all. And then a cloud appears and Jesus and the apostles and Moses and Elijah all are gathered in by this cloud, which is another theophany of God, a, a visible representation that human beings can comprehend, but it is the presence of God. And um, 
and from it a voice that repeats the message, the heart of the message at, the bapt at Jesus' baptism. This is my son whom I have chosen. And he adds, listen to him. Because that's going to be important going on, going forward from this point on, right? They're getting closer and closer to the arrest of Jesus and the crucifixion of Jesus and the death and resurrection of Jesus and the shift of responsibility from Jesus to the Holy Spirit and from the Holy Spirit to the apostles to continue to carry on the work of sp spreading the gospel and building the kingdom of God. And I think it's pretty typical of humans when we have one of those extraordinary experiences of an encounter with the living God that we're so overwhelmed that all we want to do is just stay in that moment. We want to, that's what the apostle, what Peter, James, and John wanted to do. They wanted to build a shelter. And let's just stay here, Jesus. But they couldn't because the purpose of that powerful inter encounter with God was to prepare them to be that message to the rest of the world. You can't stay and hold on to it yourself. That's not the purpose, and that's not where the power, and that's not where the future is. This week, um, I have two questions for you to think about. Um, and I want to remind you that it's in, I think it's really important for you to listen to the pastoral videos. Pastor Temple's video is available right now for you to view before your next week's readings, which are chapter um, 9, verse 51, all the way through chapter 13, uh, verse 35. That's your readings for next week. Listen to, chapel temp listen to Chapel's video and then proceed with your readings for the week. Also use that same site where you find the video. It'll say uh, discussion questions. Look those up and try to process some of those on your own because as you can see, processing all of those questions and all of the text is virtually impossible in a one lesson gathering. So some of this is going to have to be thought through on your own. Um, notice any, anything that you have questions about yourself, but two questions that I want to um, lift up for you. One is when John the Baptist was confronted by folks seeking baptism and um, John talked to the tax collector and the Roman centurion, etc., about what they needed to do. Their question had been, what then, what should I do then for repentance? And um, I want you to think about that question. Put yourself before John the Baptist at the Jor River Jordan asking him, what should I do then in regards to repentance? And I want you, to, what do you think John would tell you to do? He had suggestions for the centurion and the tax collector. What do you think he would tell you to do to get prepared? And the second question is what Jesus was asking, who do you say that I am? Who is he in your life? Is he an interesting character with kind teachings? 
are. Is he your savior? Who can you say Jesus is? Um, and those are two questions that I would ask you to think about. Let's read our closing. We rejoice in every sign of God's kingdom, in the upholding of human dignity and community, in every expression of love, justice, and reconciliation, in each act of self-giving on behalf of others, in the abundance of God's gifts entrusted to us that all may have enough. Amen. See you next week.